Hello, hello. This is Zachary Hines, and I am with Leanne Day Douglas. And we have a very special podcast in store for you. We listen, we watched Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill starring Audra McDonald. And we discussed it and we watched it and recorded our podcast before the world changed. A whole lot. And actually a lot happened right after we released our Pipeline podcast. So we watched Pipeline, released Pipeline, and then two days later, the world changed. A lot happened. Mm -hmm. There have been protests uh, all over the country in in regard to George Floyd's murder. And there's been a lot of conversation around um, acknowledging that Black Lives Matter and that we have to have these conversations within our own industry. And we have strived and are committed to doing better to uplift voices that have traditionally been underrepresented in the performing arts. But a lot of what we discuss in in reaction to Lady Day and Billie Holiday's story is very relevant to what is happening in today's world. And we thought it prudent to mention and acknowledge this moment um, before diving into the world of Billie Holiday. So we hope you enjoy the conversation. I hope you engage and join in with us by using hashtag Straz podcast and share your thoughts on Lady Day. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. I am with the lovely Lady Day. Lady, you are Lady Day. Yes. Leanne yes. Day Douglas. Yeah, I am Lady Day. Look at that. Oh my goodness. Lady, I just realized this now in the intro. Uh, me too, which is like, you'd think I would have thought of it before, but no, I just realized it too when you said it. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Day in quarantine. <laughs> I was trying to think of a place for in place of Emerson's Bar and Grill, but we are nowhere but our home. (laughs) We are still in quarantine. Yes, we are. Still in quarantine. Can you believe? No, I can't believe it. Remember when we thought it was just going to be like, okay, well, this will be now through May. And now it's the end of May. Well, yeah, first we thought, oh, this will just be a couple of weeks. And now it's almost June. Right. Well, our pets are happy. (laughs) (laughs) That they are. Yes, they are. And they've been seeing so much more theater. Yes, they have seen more theater. See more theater. See, this is really culture your pets, people. Show (laughs) them. Have them watch with you. That's right. Bougie really loved that. I I guess Bougie is a big jazz fan. Is he? I guess he he was enraptured. He actually does watch TV every now and then. And he was watching pretty much the whole time. And what were we watching? We were watching Audra McDonald, the greatest of all time, in Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill, which is... A musical about the one, the only, Billie Holiday. I love Billie Holiday. And I've listened to Billie Holiday CDs for years and never even bothered to learn anything about her or about her life. So uh, this was really interesting to get that uh, perspective on who she was as a person. Um, It really makes you understand why she sang so many sad songs. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She had quite uh, quite a life. Have yeah. you ever seen Lady Sings the Blues? No, I haven't. With Diana Ross? I have. That's another one that's on my list of movies I haven't seen, but I've always wanted to. Mm-hmm. But apparently, I mean, she was nominated for an Oscar, and I heard she should have won, but she did not. 
Mm, I don't think that happens. It does. It does. But yeah, um, we shall. I'll have to watch it and see. But Audra McDonald did an incredible job as Billie Holiday. Right. She did. And I mean, she let, let's just start a little bit with Audra McDonald, because can we say again how much we love her? So if she ever listens to this podcast, which hopefully she will one day, we love her. OK, so she has won, according to Wikipedia, six Tony Awards, and she did win a Tony for this performance as yeah. Billie Holiday. And, you know, Billie Holiday, for anybody who's listened to her, she has a unique sound. And so I was like, I don't know how she's going to pull this off. And she opened her mouth and with like the first three notes, I was like, oh my God, she sounds exactly like her. I was about to, I was thinking the same thing because Audra McDonald also has a very signature sound of her own, you know? Mm -hmm. So before watching it, I was like, how is she going to do this? Is, you know, how can someone with such an iconic sound of her own fit into portraying a role of a woman who has her own very unique voice? Because the Billie Holiday sound is very unique. It's unique and it's difficult to duplicate. And so she must have just studied her sound for a really long time to be able to teach her voice how to do that. And it sounded so authentic too. Like it didn't sound like, cause sometimes you'll hear someone like sing a share song and you're like, that is an imitation, you know? Right. But it was like, she embodied the, like she made it her own. She opened her mouth and Billie Holiday was coming out. Yeah, she really did. I was astounded. Absolutely. I still astounded, still astounded at that. So yeah, that was amazing. Even if, Everything else about the show sucked, which it didn't. But if everything else did, that alone was worth watching it to to hear her do that. So Right. And so the whole show is basically like you are at this small club in Philadelphia towards the end of Billie Holiday's life. So it's later in her career. And she is giving just one of her she's just doing an act. You're there, you're in the audience of a Billie Holiday club show and she kind of interweaves her life story through some of the songs and and you kind of see where she was at at that time kind of really kind of unstable and and unable to really perform fully yeah she was we were watching her unravel on stage basically I mean, she was at the end of her life. Uh, it said at the beginning it was set in 1959. Um, and then at the very end, right before the credits, it said four months later, she died. Um, so it is right at the end of her life. And she's unraveling. She's completely unraveling on stage. She's And, and this is part of the times, too, because if you look back at like the Rat Pack, they drank on stage. They smoked on stage. So it was kind of just what they did back then. And uh, and she was drinking heavily on stage and smoking on stage in the middle of her act. And uh, and they just did that back then. That was just part of the act. Right. Yeah. And they even there was the moment where her gloves came down and you saw the the track marks, the track marks. So her pianist had to kind of pull the gloves back up. Um, but it, it is. It's a fascinating way to tell her story because there's something in one, just getting to know her, her life a little bit more through her music and, and also kind of seeing what led to getting her there and, and the contrast of the let me entertain you kind of veneer of a performer. You know, she still was charming and funny and, and able to sing most of the songs. And, you know, there were moments where she was on and then kind of the contrast of her breaking down and, and kind of losing it. Yeah. Her falling apart and her pianist holding her together, just kind of keeping her together. He can tell by what mood she was in, 
what song he should start to play to get her to sing to kind of keep her from completely falling apart. Um, so it was really interesting to see the relationship between the two of them um, and how he kind of carried her through this performance. Um, yeah. I I did not know her story was so tragic. Um, it's just even from her childhood that she worked in brothels as a housekeeper and then at one point became a prostitute as well. Yeah. Um, she was raped uh, and attempted to be raped. She, you know, and so it it's no uh, surprise, I guess, that, you know, someone would self-medicate if you've gone through all that trauma uh, as a child. Well, and she says, all I wanted to do was sing. You know, she just wanted to sing. And so she she goes to jail, I think, for a drug charge. And yeah. she um, she says she pleads not guilty. And she goes to jail. She just thinks she'll just go to jail, do her time, come out and start singing again. And nobody told her that when you're a felon, you can't get a cabaret card. So you can't sing in the clubs. So otherwise, I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know that there were such things called cabaret cards. I know, right? And so she's like, if I'd have known, I wouldn't have pled guilty. Because um, this is my life. Singing is my life. So some friends managed to get her some gigs. But she didn't have a card. So she wasn't able to legally sing in these clubs. Right. And they would... And if you were blacklisted, they could pay you a lot less if they were going to even try to sneak you in. Mm -hmm. But that was a wild thing that that actually I looked it up. It, it existed in New York until the early 70s, uh, the cabaret card. And that was where you had to be licensed to perform in any place where uh, alcohol was being served so that you could be they knew you were an upstanding in, individual who could be trusted around all that booze. Right, right. Which is just crazy that it was up to the 70s. I mean, it's one thing that this is set in 59 and you're like, OK, it's the 50s. But up until the 70s, you had to have a cabaret card. That's crazy. Yeah, I love the sound of it, though. Cabaret card. I want one. <laughs> I'll make one for you. I'll even okay. laminate it for you. I'll laminate it and give it to you the next time I see you. Oh, good. So in October. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so it goes, but, you know, she, I love the story. You know, not only did she have to deal with all of the nonsense of, of you know, a tragic childhood. On top of that, she experiences incredible racism. She actually, I read, was one of the first, if not the first uh, female of color to do a tour uh, with uh, a big band in the South. Um, and that's where she got, uh, that's where she got the song Strange Fruit, which she is um, one of her most popular songs right. uh, about the lynchings that were taking place in the South. Um, but I love the story that she tells in the show about um, her band, the band leader who was white, uh, could go in and out of anywhere, but she would have to eat in the kitchen in these fancy restaurants and they wouldn't even let her use the restroom. Yeah. That was a really interesting part. And they were saying, we didn't even want to feed you in the kitchen. Um, we didn't want to feed you at all. So just be grateful that you're sitting here eating in the kitchen and no, you can't use the restroom. Even at her level of success at that point, she's still, they couldn't even give her the dignity to use the restroom, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it's incredible. And it's incredible that it really wasn't that long ago. And, you know, I thought it was interesting. She talked about how strange fruit reminded her of her father's death um, because he had a lung issue that the doctors just refused to uh, work on him because he was a man of color. And um, so the song Strange Fruit reminded her a lot of that injustice and how even in the years between her father's death and when she recorded it back then, 
uh, not much has changed. And now you see all these headlines right now and you have to think there's still not a lot of progress since, since then. The song is still relevant. Very cheerful. Thanks a well, lot. Well, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to cut that part. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, it's you just relevant. depressed me. Oh, it's very relevant. You just depressed me. That's all. So, yeah. Well, we're tackling real issues on this podcast. Real issues, indeed. Yeah, it was something that I was always really interested in. I, I liked Nat King Cole uh, growing up. and. Um, it was something that I had learned. I mean, the same thing, any artist of color back in that era um, had to deal with that. He would be traveling and, and entertaining with um, people like Bing Crosby and people like Frank Sinatra, and they would all be performing the same gig, but he would have to stay in a hotel 10 miles away well, everybody else got to stay where they were performing. And, um, you know, when he bought his house in California somewhere, I mean, it wasn't, it was in a white neighborhood and he got a lot of flack for that, um, from his new neighbors because they didn't think he belonged there. And, um, so yeah, anytime a person of color met any kind of success and usually it was uh, as an artist in that time, because that's what people would allow. Um, they had to jump through all these hoops just to perform their art. So watching the show, it reminded me a lot of another play that I saw called End of the Rainbow, which follows uh, one of the last concerts by Judy Garland before her death. Mm -hmm. And it's a very similar kind of, you know, we seem in pop culture to be obsessed with these tragic figures where we almost it's almost like we we bring people up to chew them up and spit them out you know we, <laughs> we kind of work them to death and um you know while their stories are very individual and specific to their life um you know Judy Garland towards the end of her career was very similar like could not get through a full concert but still had these incredible peaks and these incredible valleys all in kind of one hour performance. Uh, but we kind of seem to be obsessed with that kind of, I wonder if it is that that's, is it fame and performance that brings that out of people? Or is that something that we as a society are just drawn to? Well, it could be that the artistic personality is more, has more tendency toward that i mean as in a more emotional kind of more in touch with your emotions uh i don't know i'm making this stuff up um <laughs> you know there's they seem to have more demons i mean if you look at if you read poetry or look at a lot of poets like sylvia plath who a lot of them kill end up committing suicide right if you go through a list of poets that are like famous poets and look at how they died. It's like suicide, suicide, suicide. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, they're able to create this art because of this demon that they have with them. Um, and the way that they end up handling this demon, some people is with drugs. So, or alcohol. So that's how they tame it. So they use it when they need it for their art. But when they don't need it, they try to tame it with drugs. Right. A lot of self-medicating. You know, it's very interesting how most of them are women. Um, and I, I think there there's something to the way that we treat women and uh, view women as a society. But, um, you know, definitely with Judy Garland, she, I mean, she was like a workhorse since she was a child where they were feeding her pills so that she could keep going mm -hmm. uh, and do these crazy film shoots and just got addicted. And, and I think, yeah, when that's the way they teach you how to self-medicate, that's that and art are the only two ways to kind of keep things balanced, I guess. Um, but so much of it is, you know, so much of their lives is also about excess 
and like excess of fame, you know, they're living almost in a constant high, just kind of, you know, we can't even imagine what their lives must have been like, you know, touring so much, going from city to city, club to club, you know, there's no sense of normalcy, you know, no kind of stability. Everything's kind of on the road and, and rushing from one thing to the next. I can't imagine what that must have been like or must be like for people now. Right. Well, when things are normal now. So. Right. <laughs> yes. yeah, now everyone's at home. Never, everyone's at home. So, yeah. Yeah. But I do, I have to admit, I do love a kind of tragic figure. I don't know. I'm kind of, I feel like the, you know, it's almost like they, in some ways, are given the freedom to be, to live in the gray area, you know, where there's so many people who get, you know, kind of like the Doris Day treatment or like, you know, they get an image whether it's black or white, you're good or bad. And I feel like, you know, hearing a story like Billie Holiday is when you realize you realize the humanity in these people and that, you know, even the most towering figures and, and idols all have flaws. And some of them are significant flaws, but um, that's what makes them human. And I feel like makes them more relatable. I agree. <laughs> there was something that she said. Um, there were two things that she said that I thought were really interesting. She said she doesn't do the blues. She does jazz, which I think a lot of people would argue with because a lot of the stuff that Billie Holiday sings is really sad. Um, but she said she does the blues feeling with a jazz beat. Yeah, I loved that. I loved how yeah, she phrased that. Yeah, yeah. So she said that. And then she also said, singing is how you feel, which I thought was really interesting because since she did so many drugs and so much alcohol, maybe the only way she could make herself feel anything anymore was by doing her art. Um so I thought that was really interesting, especially, like you say, as a tragic figure to get to the end of your life. And that's the only way you can make yourself feel something anymore. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, connecting Billy with Judy again, you know, at least in these two stories, these fictional interpretations of their of their life story, uh, it is interesting that the way the the writers choose to present them is that they are fully living on stage. That's when they're truly happy. And pretty much anything off stage is them trying to recapture that high. Right. Uh, you know, the high of performance, which, and the high of an audience and, and that connection with the way you're able to express yourself through music and also connect with an audience member, you know, like Billie Holiday and the show is talking about like, I just love being in a room. It's like, I'm performing for my friends. Like she, right. She, how she was talking about missing the club atmosphere and that intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. And she kept saying, you know, I can say whatever I want. These are my friends. So, and she did, she did. And at the end, I thought it was really interesting because the whole time you, you really do feel like you're in a club. Like I was like, Ooh, I wish I could be actually sitting at a table in this club with Zach and we can both be having drinks watching Audrey McDonald because she's the best, um, be Billie Holiday. And, um, at the end, she's still singing on stage and they pan out and the entire audience is gone. I know. I love that. Black and white at that point, they pan out, it's black and white and the audience is gone. And I was like, Oh wow. Which is cool because that's something that they only could do in the filmed version. That's right. That's right. You know, cause you couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't be like, okay, everyone, and go up to the door and see that the space is empty and she's still there. Everyone um, leave and we're going to make it look black and white. <laughs> so what do you think they were trying to say? Because part of me was like, oh, like, is that like she's a ghost? What do, what do you think? I think it was trying to say, and I could ple be completely off base, but I thought it was trying to say that even though she's in a room of people, she is still alone. Mm. That's how I felt about it. That's interesting. That's interesting. I like that interpretation. It was surprising because I thought it was over. And then I was like, oh, wait, no one's in the theater anymore. No one's there. It was a nice, subtle touch that I was like, that really 
kind of had a haunting Mm -hmm. feeling to it that and where it ended I thought it really added to it and that's another that's this is something I wanted to talk about because we've been watching a lot of plays uh that have been filmed through you know for Broadway HD and there's been a lot of discussion you know we're in lots of webinars right now about how the performing arts is going to continue in the age of social distancing and you know obviously a lot of people are looking to use digital means to connect people to the performing arts and the conversation around what separates it from a filmed play from a movie well i mean there's a big difference between a filmed play and a movie i mean a movie they have sound sets they have multiple takes they have um you know they stitch it all together you know, they take all of this footage and they stitch it together and they add a, a soundtrack underneath it and they add sound effects. And, you know, there's it's completely different. And when you're filming a play to be presented, it's all one take. You got to get it right the first time. It's, it's just like you're on stage with an audience, a live audience. It's just you're not. But it's completely different from a film. In my opinion, I think it goes back to kind of intention. And I think there's, you know, I agree with what you're saying about that kind of the liveness of it, that it is one take, that it's not kind of cut and pasted together uh, is one way to separate filmed theater from cinema. Um, But I think that's going to be an interesting conversation to be had as I think more people are looking into filming performance to share with people while we're um, quarantining before we can all gather together again. And another thing it had me thinking about is in the age of social distancing, I think we're going to be seeing a lot, uh, a lot more one person shows (laughs) um, or smaller casts. Uh, you know, because it is just harder with large casts to make sure everyone is being socially distant. It's almost near impossible um, when you have a huge chorus of people, you know. Um, so what are your thoughts in general? You know, I, I I was trying to think back on the kind of one person shows I've seen in the past. And all of the ones I've seen, I've actually really loved. I saw uh, buyer and seller with Michael Yuri from uh, Ugly Betty, which was hilarious. It's about it's like about uh, Barbara Streisand has a mall. This is a true story. Barbara Streisand has a shopping mall in her basement. <laughs> her and so this writer imagined, what if she hired this struggling actor in L.A. to be the st- shopkeepers for all the stores in uh her fictional her fake mall (laughs) and uh it's it's really wonderful um and this was somewhat of a one-person show i mean she had a band and and stuff definitely the pianist she interacted with and so what are what are your thoughts because i know people have strong opinions on them i don't have strong opinions on them you don't have Leanne, Lady Leanne Day has a strong opinion on everything. I don't. I don't. It seems like I do, but I don't. I know. It, it appears so, but no. Except one person shows. Except one person shows. I, if they're good, I don't care how many people are in them. So, I mean, that's... I, I haven't... Have a, you seen many? I can't remember. I know I've seen a few, but I can't tell you what they were. Now I'm going to come up with my own one-man show just to see what your opinion of one person shows are. Get ready. Like I said, if it's good, I have no opinion. If it's crap, I'm going to let you know. I love a good tour de force. You know, like this is a tour de force performance. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. And one person shows really give, I mean, to be able to carry 90 minutes on your own with no scene partner. Mm Mm-hmm is really, really difficult. So it's almost like watching someone like run a marathon. Yeah, but she used the audience as her other teammates, I would have to say, in the scene because she's having a conversation with them. 
So there were bodies there. It's not like she was just on stage and there was nobody. And she had a dog. She brought her dog on stage. So Which I have a rule. I would I will never perform with an animal or a child. They will always upstage me. <laughs> It's true. When she had that dog out, I was all I was thinking about was the dog. You're funny. I was like, "Oh, look at the dog!" <laughs> but that's probably good for her because she's like, "Damn, I need a I break. need a break." Everybody, look at something else for a second. Yeah, yeah. So, are you gonna rate it? I am going to rate it three gardenia flowers out of three. All right, I agree with that. Yeah, it was fantastic. I'd watch it again. Fantastic. Bravo. Audra, call me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next time, what are we watching? Tune in next week. We're going to be talking about the iconic Victor Victoria. It is so much fun. I haven't seen that movie in forever, so I can't wait to relive that. Yeah. Until then, be kind, be creative, take care of each other, take care of yourself, and we'll catch you next week. 